All right, the next section that deals with the loan financing are some loan types. And I wanna go through a couple different loan types so that you guys at least know the basic terminology and know what you're talking about when you talk to a lender so that you can help your client potentially get the best thing possible. So the first loan I wanna talk about is this thing called a conventional loan. All right, so let's go over here. A conventional loan is a loan that is privately funded, meaning not one of the governments, not an FHA, not VA, not USDA, not any of those. So it's privately funded. And typically, most of your conventional loans are going to be at 80% LTV, all right? So LTV stands for loan to value. So what you've got here is the value of the property and then the value of the loan and the ratio of those two would be loan to value or the slang is loan to value LTV and conventional loves 80% and lower loan to value, all right? So basically it doesn't really matter what the value of the house is or the loan, as long as the ratio of the two is 80%. Now, the key thing you have to key in here is what's the value? The value is defined as either the sales price or the appraised value, whichever is the lower of the two, all right? So if you agree to buy a house for 100 and the appraisal comes in at 90, the bank says the value is 90 and they will loan 80% of that, which is 72 grand. That is an 80% loan to value. Now let's say you have the same house, the appraiser said, yes, you agreed to buy it for 90 and I can appraise it for, a, or you agreed to buy it for 100 and I uh, say it's worth 100, then the bank's gonna loan 80. That's still 80%. All right, so that's typically what a conventional loan means, is that it is privately funded, 80% loan to value. Now, the reason that lenders like government-backed loans more than they do conventional loans is because a government-backed loan, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, is actually insured by one of the government agencies. FHA, VA, SBA, not for residents, but it's the same concept, USDA, and because of that insurance, they feel much safer, and that safer translates into lower rates. That's why most of the time, all your government loans have an interest rate lower than a conventional loan. Now, they've got these new things now called insured conventional. And what an insured conventional is, is basically when the loan to value goes over that 80%, the bank is going to ask you to buy a insurance policy. All right, so let's look at this. Let's say the value is 100, the loan is 80, that's an 80% loan to value. Now, if something happens to the value of the home and it drops a little bit down into here, is the, in this scenario, is the bank really worried? No, let's say the value drops to 93 for whatever reason. The bank still is getting the first 80 if you sell it, you are the one that lost 7,000 in equity, not the bank. Does the bank really give a damn that you lost money? No, they don't really care, all right? Now let's change the scenario. Say it's 100 is the value, and they've loaned you 100. This is that beautiful loan that people always wanna see zero dollars down, well, there's a problem with that. Now you're 100% loan to value. 
So in this particular case, your loan to value is 100%. Now, if the value loses down to here, you now have a value here and your loan is above your value. That is literally upside down, right? Does the bank care about this? Oh, most certainly, because now it is their money that's just got lost because you had no equity in a 100% loan to value. So they force you to buy an insurance policy that covers that potential loss. Welcome to PMI, private mortgage insurance, all right? So what I'm saying is a conventional loan is 80% loan to value, typically no PMI. But you can get an insured conventional. Conventional means it's not insured by the government. So it's private mortgage insurance. So let's say you get a 90% loan to value. Well, that is over their 80, so they want you to buy an insurance policy. You may get PMI, so it is an insured conventional loan, and it's conventional because it's privately funded. It is not government-backed, all right? So that would be the conventional term versus an insured conventional. Insured conventional, think about it almost like an FHA, still has low down payments. You can get an insured conventional with a 95% loan to value. The only difference is the insurance is not backed by the government. It's a private mortgage insurance, all right? And that is, you know, what we're talking about right here. That's PMI right there. <clears throat> now, there are these things that they call government loans. And the reason I put the word loans in is because they're really not loans. Oh, there's the conforming that we're going to talk about here in just a second. Let's talk about the government. There are three big major ones that you guys hear about. You got an FHA, you got a VA, and then you got USDA. These are the three typical loans that you will see that are government. Now, the thing that you need to worry about this is these, and the reason I put this in loan parentheses a minute ago, see it's in parentheses right here, is because they don't actually loan the money. That's right. We say it all the time. Some of us, including me still, I catch me saying, you know, it's an FHA loan. There is no such thing as an FHA loan, all right? It's an FHA insured loan. And now we're back to what I just talked about. The insurance or the government is backing that loan. That loan is still made by that primary lender. Still made by Fifth Third or PNC or whoever's approved. The bank still loans the money. Think of the FHA almost like a co-signer. Basically, the FHA is going to say, hey, Raymond's a good guy, Mr. Bank, loan him money. If he does something wrong, we will cover it to make sure that you, bank, do not lose any money. So it's an FHA insured loan. Now, the cool thing about the FHA insured loan is it allows most lenders to only have a down payment of 3.5%. So it is non-conventional, meaning it's above that 80% loan to value. So there is PMI that comes with it, all right? Because the lender is actually loaning you 96.5%. FHA is very similar, only it's actually a, I can't even spell guarantee. It's, an, it's a VA, is a VA guaranteed loan once again, it's the bank that makes the loan, not the VA. The VA does not make loans. They guarantee 
that the veteran that is getting the loan is good for it, and should that veteran default, the VA will step in and help the bank. All right, same thing, USDA. Now, USDA is pretty cool. We'll go back over here and show you. USDA actually has what they call guaranteed loans, and the USDA does direct loans. Okay, so what I'm saying here is in the form of the USDA, they can guarantee a loan so that your bank would make the loan and the USDA guarantees the bank won't get hurt. Or they can actually do a direct loan and this is the one case where the USDA does loan the money. So there are direct lenders of USDA. So when someone's getting a USDA loan, you kind of got to understand, are they getting a USDA guaranteed loan or are they getting one directly from the USDA? So there are direct loans and guaranteed loans that both come from the USDA. Loans can also be classified as either conforming or non-conforming. All right, so here we go. Conforming, think of it this way. Conforming means that the loans that are being written conform to the financing limits set by Fannie Mae. Or, uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> the guidelines are set by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. All right? But the financing limits are set by the Federal Housing Finance Agency. All right? And somewhere, I think Marion County, it's like... $416,000 is the financing limit. Don't quote me on that. And that's one of those numbers that I'm saying is I understand the concept of what conforming is and I understand there's a limit. This number can change and has changed over the years. That would be where you would say, okay, hey, that specific piece of information you need to get from your lender or you would call the lender and talk to them about it, all right? So conforming loans just meet the underwriting guidelines by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, where a non-conforming loan doesn't. Most of your non-conforming loans that do not meet the guideline, the reason they typically don't meet the guideline is because they are above that limit. They are greater than, and I'm just gonna do this. And we call those jumbo loans. You know, 600, 700 million. So they are not conforming because they do not meet the underwriting guidelines. But typically the guideline they're missing is this fi financing limit. It cannot be above a certain number. All right. So that would be the conforming and non-conforming. Now, they've got things called the government service enterprises. These are the two buyers of the loan. The GSEs are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are the people that package the loans up and bundle them and sell them to the investors, the industrial or institutional size investors. And they have guidelines on what they consider, and I'm using finger quotes here, safe for the investor. Now, they cannot be completely risk-free, hence the word invest, but they try and reduce it, and this meeting these guidelines a lot of times is where real estate agents get heartburn with their mortgage broker because they think the mortgage bro broker's crazy when in reality, it's these companies. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna get this primary lender that says, we want two years of taxes. So you go and you collect your two years of taxes from your client or you call your client and have them send in the two years of taxes. Well, then the primary lender decides they want to sell it to a secondary lender who is Fannie Mae. And Fannie Mae says, you know, we really want to be <clears throat> extra careful. We want our loans to be vetted with three years of taxes. So now what happens is the underwriter for the primary lender calls the client back and go, hey, we need another year of taxes. And you're like, damn it, dude. Why didn't you tell me that when you first got me? Well, 
because the GSEs have an overlay and an overlay is a more restrictive method of looking at the property to be safer. They want to make sure that that guy has been stable for three years rather than the two years the lender wanted. And that's just one example of how overlays work. They could have a whole bunch of other guidelines, which we're not going to get into. You know, how much money they can only deposit so much at a time. If it's greater than a $10,000 deposit, hey, we want to know where that came from to make sure several different things. One is that your buddy didn't loan you money just to buy the house. You're maybe not involved in some illegal activities. So they may look at deposits differently than a lender does. So the GSEs, when they sell these on the secondary market, could potentially add another layer of information, hence the word an overlay, on the original lender's requirements. Okay, now I know that that's confusing, uh, but if you have a question, send me an email at raymond at realuniversity.com. Now, there's some other loans in here that might be beneficial to talk about right now. First one I want to talk about is an ARM. An adjustable rate mortgage. Um, now it's funny, I'm also a licensed mortgage broker and I am a partner in a mortgage company and during our testing procedures, we, have, we are licensed here and in Florida and during our Florida testing procedures, they talked about an ARM, and one of the choices was, what does ARM stand for? And one of the choices was this. <laughs> I really, an awesome rate mortgage. That would be cool. That's not what it stands for, all right? That's not what it stands for stands for adjustable rate mortgage. Meaning, if you go back to here, when you look at most of your um, conventional and stuff like this, you hear the term 30 year and then this word fixed, meaning the interest rate is fixed. Whatever it's quoted to, you know, 3.25%, it's that interest rate throughout the 30 years, so it would be 30 year fixed. The adjustable obviously makes sense that the adjustable rate mortgage could adjust throughout the years. And we're not going to go into all of the stuff that goes into creating an arm, but basically you've got some financial index that it's tied to, You've got some margin on top of that index. Then you've got rate caps. And the rate caps are there as a protection so that the client doesn't have a interest rate here one month and then an interest rate here next month like that. And then you've got this conversion fee. And the conversion fee is a fee if a person decides uh, that they want to go from an adjustable rate to a fixed, they can pay a fee and stop, and there is, it becomes fixed from there on out, all right? If you have more questions about those contents on what a, these four are, feel free to call me uh, or email me and we can go over it. So that would be an adjustable rate mortgage, and you know, you, get, you see these things like a 3-1, means it's fixed for the first three years and then it adjusts every year after that. You know, they've got a 3-2, they can have a 5-1. Uh, I've seen 1-1s, one that's a terrible arm, by the way. Um, they've got this thing called a two-step adjustable rate. And basically that's a predetermined, so for like 10 years it may be here and then there for the balance. So this might be the first 10 years, then this might be 20 years, and there's two steps, and it's a determined, so it might be here at six, and then it goes to seven and a half, all right? So that is the adjustable rate mortgage that they talk about. The second one, IO, which stands for interest only. Now think of interest only as just renting the money. You start here, 
and you owe 100 k and every month you make payments, and for that five-year length, when you get done, guess what you owe? You still owe 100 k All you paid during this period was the interest on that money. You basically rented that money for that five years. Why would you do that? Well, there's a couple reasons why you would do that. One is if it's an investment property, your cash flow is greater because on an interest only is going to be lower than if you were paying an amortized rate. So you get the spread right here of making money. The third re or another reason is if you're using it to buy a property where you know the value is going to be uh, significantly higher in that time frame, like maybe the old Florida market or California. So you buy it at 100, you pay these minimal interest payments while they're building it for five years or building the complex or whatever. Then when the loan comes due, you sell the property for 150, you pay off the, the 100 that you owe, and there's your profit, all right? So interest only can work in an investment scenario or in a highly appreciating property scenario. Those work both ways. The next one on the list there is a land contract. This is owner financing. This is where the owner takes back, well, no, actually, I, don't, I wanna make sure I tell you the truth because I don't want you to get confused. In a land contract, we use the words vendor and vendee. Vendor would be the guy that owns the actual title. And uh, the vendor owns, I just lost my mind. The vendor has equitable title. I had to hit the pause there for a minute because I lost my mind. It's what happens when you get old. Sometimes you hear the vendor is what they call naked title because he actually is owning it. He's the actual owner on record, but this guy has possession. This would be a land contract. By the way, while we're here, let's go over my pet peeve, probably number three on the list of pet peeves is this concept. All right, there is no such animal as a rent to own. Rent implies landlord, owner implies grantor or grantee, or vendor and vendee, but it certainly does not imply lessor or lessee. It is either a land contract, sometimes you hear it called a contract for deed, or you can put a person on a lease and then give them an option to exercise later at the end of the lease. But there is no such animal as a rent to own. Anybody that says that is using an unscrupulous, unethical technique to try and screw the whatever, I don't even know if you'd call it a tenant or a owner or what, no such thing. You cannot pay monthly rent and be a tenant if part of that money goes to ownership, by definition, that's a land contract, all right? What else we got? Blanket loans. Blanket loans would work pretty cool. Matter of fact, we just wrote a blanket loan the other day. Blanket loan is when you use multiple properties to secure one loan. You know, hey, I don't wanna go through the problem of getting three loans. So I'll get one loan and secure it with three of my rentals. The only downside to this is when you look at it, you're going to see this lien amount of 300 and it's valued at 100. It looks like it's way over leveraged. It looks upside down. But what's going to happen is when this investor decides he wants to sell this property, Blanket loans take into consideration this term called a partial release. And what a partial release is, it says, okay, so you sell this home and you collected 150,000 for it, 
what we need you to do for us to give you this partial release. We want you to pay a significant amount of it down and your lien then goes to this. Because they paid a hundred to the principal and then same thing. They sell for 150. They put a significant portion down to pay down the principal. And they release the portion of it. Now they only owe 100. They kept the 50. Paid the 100. They sell the last one. Use the 100 to pay off the existing what's left of this blanket loan and keep the 50. And voila, there's your profit in the form of three $50 profits and you've paid <clears throat> your lien off and they do it in partial increments. That is what is called a blanket loan. There is a package loan. A package loan is where you actually mortgage real property and personal property in with the mortgage. Because typically personal property sells with what's called a bill of sale. Now, in the residential world that we deal with, most of the time, the personal property value is very plus tax. <laughs> it's very nominal. You know, 100 bucks, 200 bucks. What's a, wash, what's a used washer and dryer worth? A used pool table. So we don't deal a lot with that issue. We actually do have a form called a... Uh, the, it's a form in zip forms called the personal property conveyance where you could actually put that stuff on that separate form. But what about this? What happens if you're going out and buying a $2.5 million apartment complex and each one of the 100 apartments came with a refrigerator and a washer and dryer? Now you've got 100 sets of washers and dryers and 100 refrigerators that could be construed as personal property. Somebody's going to say, you know, the value of that is probably $250,000. Well, then reality is the value of the real property is 200 or 2,250,000. And most mortgage brokers are going to say, well, I could loan you a mortgage on this part, but this part, you're going to have to bring cash because we'll give you the 80% loan to value, but only of this amount. See what I'm saying? Uh, what's, uh, what is that? 450,000, so that's 1.8 million we'll loan. The other you bring on your, bring yourself. Well, now you would also have to bring that to get to that number. What a package loan does is it allows you to include both real and personal and mortgage it. So now you actually do have a 250,000 and they're gonna give you that 80%, uh, which is $2 million. Now you're only bringing 500,000 here. Here you're bringing upwards of 700 and that's just quick math. <clears throat> what is that? 450, yeah, 700 grand. Here you're bringing 500 grand. So the difference in that package loan can save you $200,000 out of your pocket. All right. Those are the different types of loans. I'm going to tell you that you're going to be see most of these loans are going to be the majority of what you deal with in our residential world here is either some sort of conventional loan or one of the government loans. That's probably going to be 95% of everything you ever do. All right, I know that was a lot of information and I understand if it's confusing, 
But what I would ask is if you have questions, feel free to get a hold of me. You can email me at Raymond at realuniversity.com. And uh, we still got some more Sloan stuff I want to talk about. So stick around.